I've been working in water conservation and um, actually in the water industry for 24 years. So um, lots of information, probably more than you need. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about when in drought, let's conserve. So our basic agenda is going to go over um, how much water is too much and ways to save indoors and outdoors. And then, of course, how Chandler can help. Um, we won't be focusing on what the city of Chandler does to conserve and manage our water within the city, as that was part of our last presentation. So today we'll primarily focus on what you can do to conserve and the services that Chandler has to help you. So due to the nature of what's in the news currently, um, our workshop title was completely appropriate. Um, however, as our slide says, we live in the desert and we need to conserve like we mean it. Um, so being that we live in the desert, in Chandler, we strive to make conservation a way of life. It's been part of our ethos since the early 90s when we officially started our water conservation program. It's not just about conserving for a temporary condition like drought, um, but rather about making conservation an, in, an integral part of our lives. Uh, we want conservation to be something you are always doing. It, should be, it shouldn't be a one-time event, but rather something that we're thinking about all the time. So one of the things, I think one of the hardest things is we all want to conserve, but how do we know where to start? Um, and do we even need to conserve? Maybe we're right on track. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of our residential water use calendar. So this is accessible um, on through our site, which of course is Chandler, well, of course it's chandlerez.gov slash water. And you can find all of these resources that I'm showing you today. Um, but I'll also show you some other ways that you can track that stuff down as well. So the calculator itself was developed through a partnership that we have with Arizona Municipal Water Users Association, which is basically, um, it's a conglomeration of 10 uh, Phoenix Metro cities uh, that come together and we kind of pool our funds. We come together to talk about the topics of the day um, and stay apprised of you know, everything that's going on. And, um, and, and it's kind of a trouble solving location. It's also where we can develop a lot of the materials that um, we'll be showing you today. So the cities all come together um, as a brain trust to develop this stuff for you. So the, the calculator itself, it's basically, it takes a general survey of your personal water use, and then it gives you a calculation. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen right now. And we'll share that. And I will share the calculator. Okay. So does everybody see the little house? Are we seeing the house on the screen now? Aubrey? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so as you scroll through this, um, the, don't let this trick you. It looks like a button but you actually have to click the get started button. And so this site will basically take you through some basic questions about you and how your family uses water. So of course you're gonna tell it what city you live in and how many people live in your home. I actually, I'm gonna do this for me and my husband. Um, if, I, if my boys were living at home, I would count them, um, but they are kind of living on their own now. Um, and then you want to tell it when your house was built, because there were some standards that came into play that actually started making homes more efficient um, post-92. Uh, so that's why I'd ask you that question. Then it will take you through each of the rooms in your house. So it starts with the bathroom. You see these little eyes? If you're looking for more tips on how to save water, there's all sorts of tips by clicking on the eyes in there. And then it's going to ask you um, questions about the bathroom. <laughs> How long is the average shower in your home? My husband and I are really great about taking short showers. So between myself, about eight minutes, and he's dead on five. So I would pick six or seven. So we'll just go with seven. And then how many baths are taken in the house? We're not big bath takers. So we'll leave that as zero. And then we're going to get to the kitchen again. It's got the eyes with the tips. And then it's is your dishwasher energy star and purchased after 2006. Yes, because those are more efficient and use less water. And then how many dishwasher loads are done each week? And between my husband and I, we actually use one. And then, because of course we wanna do full loads only. So 
Then we get to the laundry room. Do you own a high efficiency washing machine? Yes. And how many loads of laundry are done each week? We usually do about three. And then we get to our outdoor use. For time's sake, because we have so much information to go over, I'm gonna go ahead and skip the measuring tool. But if you're not sure, you can actually um, pull up your address in the measuring tool and you can measure um, all of the information it's asking for. So for instance, here it's asking for how many square feet of grass are on your property. And actually I have, let's see if I have to backspace over zero, 1256 square feet in my front and backyard. Is the grass overseeded? No, that's one of my conservation measures. And then how many square feet of rock or desert landscaping are on your property? So that's gonna be any of your plants that are in, um, in the granite areas or the non-grass areas. And so I have 3000 square feet of non-grass. And, um, and then basically it's gonna ask you if you have very drought tolerant, desert adapted or high water use. So if you're very drought tolerant, that's gonna be like primarily cactus and succulents. Um, desert adapted, of course, is going to include some of our desert adapted plants, but that's also what I would select if you have primarily desert adapted and maybe a couple high water use. So you kind of have to make a judgment call there. If you have all orange and citrus trees, um, you're going to want to stick with high water use. So I'm going to go in the middle there with desert adapted. And how would you describe your plant density? So that's sparse, medium, or dense. Dense is going to be like you can hardly see any granite between your plants. Um, sparse is going to be, you just, it's very spread out. It's mostly rock and um, in between your plants. So dense is definitely going to be grass is going to fall in that, in that category. I would say we're, we're medium. And then um, does your yard have a pool? Mine does. And then you're going to put your square footage of the boundaries of your pool. And again, you can use that measuring tool. Um, you don't have to use this measuring tool. If you have another one, you can take your measurements on that. Then you're going to click to your next page, and then it's going to calculate and give you a breakdown of how your water is used. So for instance, in, in my house, about a quarter of our water actually goes inside, but the majority of it goes outdoors. And let me tell you, when I have my boys included in this, we get really close to about 50-50. So our annual indoor water use, it breaks down how we use that water. And you can see the majority of our water actually goes to our showers here. Um, and that's even with us taking efficient showers. But so if you're buying those um, higher efficiency appliances, um, you'll, you'll notice that that water goes to the showers. Um, and then your annual outdoor water use, it again breaks it down by your different types of landscaping. So you have your grassland, your grass, your um, DG landscaping, and then if you have a pool. Then it will break down and tell you how many gallons you should be using each month. Um, and if you are a Chandler resident, I'm not sure that everybody logged in today is, um, you can go into your online account and you should be able to locate your water usage um, for the past year. So you can actually input your personal information in here. What I would be um, cognizant of though, is uh, your bill should tell you what day your um, read is typically taken. So if your read is taken on the first of the month, so say January 1, that usage is actually for December because all of the consumption happened before. If your read is taken like on the 30th or later in the month, then it's going to be more likely to be January. So you'll just want to be conscious of that, that you'll put your December usage or I'm sorry, your January usage into the December slot, if depending on when that um, read is taken. If that doesn't make sense to you, please feel free to reach out to me later and I'm happy to explain that a little bit better. Just for time constraints, I don't have all of my, my historical usage, but if you did, you'd plug it in, you'd submit the info and it would actually give you a comparison of your actual to your estimated, it'll graph that out for you. So um, this is a really great way to determine where you stand as far as your water use. Um, but even with this, if you're taking the longer showers, it's still not going to tell you that you're using too much water. So there are still ways that you could conserve. But the key thing is your landscape demands. It will give you, um, it will get you more in line with where you should be um, based on what your landscape use is. 
So we'll go ahead and I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna stop sharing. And we'll switch back over. Okay, are we back on the residential water use calculator? Awesome, thank you, Aubrey. Okay, so conservation, where do we start? Well, now that we know um, how much water we use, we can start thinking about how we wanna conserve water, what we can do um, to help us save some water. So just to let you know, um, up to 70% of water is used outdoors in our monthly landscapes. Um, and so the average, this, this was from a study done for the Metro Phoenix area. Um, so the average home uses 50 to 70% of their monthly water use outdoors. So we'll go over some um, water saving tips for outdoors, but of course, due to our time constraints, this is not all encompassing. Some of the topics we'll discuss will be landscape, um, swimming pools, and swamp coolers. So our outdoor water saving tips. Of course, always if you can, select low water use plants. Um, they're designed for Phoenix area and they're gonna be the easiest maintenance and they're going to give you, um, they're gonna use the least amount of water. And they'll also survive our weather better. <laughs> Um, also, avoid overwatering. Um, it's amazing how many people overwater, um, which, especially given that landscapes take so much water in general, um, if you're overwatering, it just makes it that much worse. So, also, if you can change your watering schedule for the weather at least four times a year, um, that would be very helpful because our the plant demands change significantly depending on what the weather is doing. Also, periodically check your system for leaks and malfunctions. You'll wanna actually turn on your system once in a while because a lot of us, for energy reasons, we don't wanna water when the sun is up because the water evaporates, um, which is our number five there. Uh, but you wanna make sure that you don't have any breaks, but we turn, we usually run our systems at night when we're sleeping or often when we're away at work. So we may not see when there's leaks or problems occurring. So those are definitely something you wanna do at least you know once or twice a year. If you can't remember <laughs> when to um, change your water or what you, your watering frequency should be, uh, we do have a handy tool that you can just text when to water to 33222. And, um, and you'll get an alert every month letting you know um, how frequently you should be watering, what the weather is doing, things like that, so that you can make those adjustments. So really cool, handy tool. Now, I mean, I know we don't have volume on, but um, uh, which lawn is, what's the difference here? <laughs> Do we see any difference in the lawn? And key information, our grass does not need to be watered every day. Um, certainly not more than once a day, unless you happen to be in an overseeding process or it, if you have slope and you're trying to get the water to soak in in between cycles instead of running um, for a longer runtime and have half of it run off of the, um, off your property. So there is no difference here, except that one of these lawns is using best management practices for root health, given our soil makeup here. So some key takeaways about grass is that Bermuda grass only needs to be watered once every three days during summer. And winter rye only needs to be watered once every seven to 14 days during winter. And I know I see lots of people watering their winter grass every day and it really doesn't need it. It just makes it wetter and it makes it need to be, uh, you need to cut the grass more frequently because it grows very fast. And if you have kids that play outside, you don't want that really wet winter grass because they're going to come in with green pants after playing on it. Um, grass um, to be healthy should be watered to a depth of six to 10 inches. Uh, you can take a long screwdriver and, you know, just push it into your soil to see um, how that depth is going. Any deeper than that, it's just saturating soil and not... Um, and just wasting water. Um, you want to make sure to adjust your sprinklers to make sure that they're only spraying on the grass and not sidewalks and driveways. 
and um, and even your block walls that the, our water will definitely break down the um, concrete in your block walls and driveways and things. Um, you also want to mow fairly regularly to prevent grass from obstructing the sprinkler spray because that will cause you to have um, brown spots or weak spots because you're not getting even coverage. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned the difference between those two lawns. One is using 30,000 gallons versus 14,000 gallons. And again, that goes back to good scheduling maintenance. Our outdoor saving tips for swimming pools. Um, just like your irrigation system, you want to turn it on every once in a while to check for leaks. And you'll want to check around your pump system primarily to see if you've got drips um, or any other kind of leaks like that. Also, your autofill valve, um, it can actually get overwhelmed. So your autofill valve is a float valve. So it works very similar to a lot of the toilet valves. Um, basically, there's some type of float mechanism, uh, which can, on the swimming pools, a lot of times it looks like a little plastic bottle that's in there. So what's happening is as the level of the pool changes, it's either lifting that plastic bottle or letting the plastic bottle drop. Um, when it drops, it's basically opening the valve because your pool level needs to be elevated again, brought up to whatever whatever the consistent level is that you prefer it at. Um, and then as that pool level rises, it pushes that valve closed again. Um, but just as a warning, during monsoon season or heavy rains, um, sometimes your pool will fill further than you would normally fill it. And what will happen is that little plastic bottle is now submerged in water and it cannot find its set point once it's submerged like that. So um, what can happen is that your pool will continuously fill because that, that like, like I said, that little float can't shut the valve off. And it's very rare that your pool will actually overfill um, because most of the time your pool decking is a separate pour from the actual body of the pool and the water will seep in between that deck and the um, swimming pool body itself. So, um, and depending on how big that decking is, you may not see the signs of that soil saturation that's occurring underneath your deck. So those are some things to watch for, especially during our heavy rain seasons. A lot of times what I do is I will, um, I'll actually turn off my autofill after a heavy rain. And then I'll just keep an eye on the pool to see when the evaporation level has brought it down to where I want it to be. Then I turn my autofill back on and I just watch it to make sure that it doesn't go right back up to the edge because then I know I need to make an adjustment on that autofiller. And then just a couple additional tips is, you know, using a pool co cover to minimize evaporation. Um, also, you only want to backwash your, um, your pool uh, when it's needed. Um, and then you only want to backwash until the water runs clear. You don't really need to go longer than that. Um, the more often you're backwashing, the more often you're, you're basically taking a, doing a partial drain on your pool. Um, also, that backwash water is great for your plants as long as they're salt tolerant. Um, most of your grasses will handle that and then some of our plants, but definitely um, be a little bit more cautious with the plants to make sure that they are in fact salt tolerant, but the grass can definitely handle it. Also, you don't want to overfill your pool. Keep it right about the halfway line on the, um, the skimmer box and that, that should keep you right at that best conservation level. And it's mostly you're your preventing splash out when you're doing that. And then I don't know how many of you still have um, evaporative coolers or swamp coolers. Um, some people do still have them. They also are run with one of those float type assemblies um, and can have the same kind of difficulties or malfunction potential that like your swimming pool autofill has, or even your toilet has for that matter. Um, but if the float gets off, it, it will actually overfill that system. And um, if you're not looking around your house periodically, it'll just be running down onto the ground and that can cause really big um, water bills because it can be a lot of water. Also, you'll want to check the pan um, for corrosion because that can result in leaks. Um, and then look for signs of rust and water marks around the installation site. 
And then um, if you can use recirculating pumps and um, that just helps keep things flowing better. And then also make needed adjustments to ensure even water distribution on the, on the, um, the pads. Now we're to our indoor water conservation, which of course includes bathrooms, kitchens, laundry rooms, and then we have some additional equipment that we'll discuss as well. So as noted previously, the majority of water use in Chandler happens outdoors. Um, however, there are a number of ways you can save indoors as well. Much of conservation is behavioral. So I'm sure you probably know this already, but just to mention, um, those would include taking shorter showers, no longer than five minutes if possible, um, turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth and shaving, and only washing full loads of laundry or dishes, and of course, so many more. Um, and I'll mention another place where you can find tons more tips on indoor water savings and, and outdoor for that matter. Um, but today we're just going to focus on water using fixtures and appliances um, and equipment within the home. So for fixtures and appliances, of course, we have faucets and aerators, toilets, shower heads, dishwashers, and washing machines. Um, most of the homes in Chandler were built after the 1992 plumbing standards. Um, and those standards required the use of low flow or high efficiency water use fixtures and appliances. Um, if you own a home um, that was built Prior to 1992, we offer a free um, conservation retrofit kit. And that kit includes a high efficiency shower head. You can kind of see in that lower picture there. Um, and then two bathroom aerators, a kitchen aerator, and a toilet displacement bag, which is kind of, if any of you remember people putting bricks in their toilet so that they could um, use less water in the tank. It's kind of like that, but those, those bricks or rocks, they can break down and put particles into your tank, and then they make it sometimes difficult for the flapper to find its proper seal, and you can actually have water end up running down the drain continuously. So the displacement bag allows you to one time fill it up with water. It'll take up that same space, but it's a nice plastic bag that will survive much better in that toilet environment. Um, and then um, if you do have an older home and or a newer one, and you're looking to replace older fixtures and appliances, we always recommend that you look for products with the water sense label, which is shown up here in the corner there. Um, those have all been engineered to work well while still using less water. And um, if you really, okay, so if you are gonna be replacing a toilet, um, of course, look for that water sense label. But if you really want to make sure you have a premium toilet that is not only as efficient as possible, but also flushes really well, um, you want to look for the, the MAP testing. And I don't know exactly what MAP stands for, the MAP, but um, it basically tests how well the toilet flushes human waste. So the rating indicates the number of grams the toilet will flush. Um, so the higher the number, the more waste it will flush. So just something to think about when you're looking for a replacement toilet. And um, the other thing is your shower head. Shower heads are, to me, the hardest thing to find an efficient shower head that you find gives you that comfort and the, the feel that you want from it. So my general recommendation for locating a high efficiency shower head um, is to go to there. There's one or two um, plumbing showrooms that actually have water supply to the different shower heads. Uh, I think they're both in Scottsdale, but you can, if you, it's kind of worth a drive to go up there and you can actually turn on the showers and you can feel how the water feels coming out of there. Um, because like for me, it, it all depends on how they design them. Some of them, they just make the droplets smaller, but you're still getting a lot of them. But for me, I like a really hot shower and I'm kind of short. So by the time that the smaller drops get to me, 
the temperature has dropped on the, on the droplets because you're adding more surface area to the water. So there are different designs that will give you the feel that you want. So, and we all have our particularities. So that's my recommendation, recommendation to y'all if you're trying to find a, a good shower head that is going to give you efficiency and the feel that you want. Also, if you're looking for um, dishwashers and often even on the washing machines, you want to look for the Energy Star label if you can't find the Water Sense label because um, the Energy Star was a label that the EPA had prior to Water Sense, and they didn't want everybody or the manufacturers to have to start double labeling things. So they just incorporated the water savings um, uh, requirements within the Energy Star label for water using um, appliances. So something to keep in mind there. You might not find it on some of those appliances. This is just a super cool tool that I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, it's an Evolve, Evolve Showerhead modifier. So um, basically, it's just that little device, and you can install it prior to any showerhead you want to put on there. This one, this picture, of course, shows the Evolve showerhead, but you could put any shower um, head at the end of this. And what it does is it, um, when you're trying to bring your water up to temperature, um, and of course we turn on the water and we usually, because we don't want to stand there waiting and feeling the water until we know right the minute that it goes to hot, we usually go and we do something else. <laughs> we go brush our teeth or we go get our cup of coffee and maybe that takes longer than necessary. So now not only are we wasting water that's running down the drain, but we're also wasting hot water, which has an energy requirement as well. So what this does is once the water gets up to temperature, it will take it down to a drip, just like in the little picture with the hand. And, um, and it, so the drip allows it to stay at temperature until you get back. And when you're ready, you just pull that little, um, that little string and it will go back to full flow and you can take your shower without wasting a bunch of water. So just, just thought I'd mention that because it's super snazzy. Um, and it was something, I don't have one now, but when my boys were at home and I already told you they took longer showers, um, that was definitely something that I think was just a major savior for us. Um, let's see, just make sure that I hit everything here. So, yeah. Then we have our other water using appliances, our indoor appliances. Um, obviously we all have water heaters. So, um, so you might not have a water softener in an RO um, because those are mostly to treat your water. So some people like to have that extra treatment at your home. And with, with both the water softener and the RO system, those are water treatment systems. They're not conservation systems. And the only reason I mention that is because we have done some surveys and, and, um, We've gotten responses back that those are how people can serve. But truthfully, both of those devices waste water to give you the clean water because um, th there's, there's just a cleaning process that's involved there. The water softeners don't quite use waste as much water, like one for one but they're, they're also cleaning a lot more water. So, so like I said, every time the water softeners regenerate, it's about 30 gallons. So you want to make sure that those are set to regenerate only as often as you need to. So for instance, when my, when my boys were at home and playing sports and I was doing probably four to five loads of laundry every week, all of their stinky sporty stuff, um, my softener was regenerating once a week. So you know, wherever you're at, take that into account and, and consider that. One of the easier ways to deal with that is if you buy, um, if you have a, a water softener that regenerates on demand. So it's based on the amount of gallons that run, runs through the equipment. So it will only regenerate when it needs to. Um, that's, a, that's a good conservation measure there. Um, your RO systems, they waste four gallons for every one gallon of clean water that's produced. Um, I mean, technically, if you're going to go with buying treated bottled water, you're saving water with the RO system over the bottled water because bottled water is still primarily just RO. 
treated. And then you also have the manufacturing of all those plastic bottles. And of course, there's the um, landfill waste. So there's give and takes, but I'd always recommend researching and um, selecting the most efficient product that's out there. Um, there are some that are claiming to be zero waste, but there's a lot that goes into that. A lot of them are trying to recycle it into other systems that you can use like for your showering and things like that. But definitely something to think about when you're purchasing an RO. You also want to make sure that you keep them maintained. The better maintained they are, um, the better the filters work and, and the closer they stay to being as efficient as they can be because they can waste as much as 25 gallons to every one gallon of clean water produced. So keep that in mind. As far as your um, water heater goes, um, you do want to flush those at least once a year um, and twice a year is better, but um, that helps to prevent them from deteriorating um, by taking out all the sediments at the, in, out of the bottom there. You can see in the picture, there's um, the little spigot on the end. If you hook a hose to that, run it down the driveway so it doesn't flood out your garage and then just um, flush that out. Um, I, but be cautious if you haven't done that in years and years um, because you can um, plug things up and then it may be hard to close. So just be careful the first time you do that. Um, also, of course, be careful because that water coming out of there is hot. Um, another thing, and this is just a handy tip to extend the life of your water heater, is to, um, there's what's called an anode inside your water heater. And the anode is, it's a, it's a sacrificial metal, basically. And so it's there to, so that the water, water's going to break things down. It just does. And the anode is a sacrificial metal so that it doesn't break down the walls of the water heater. And it usually kind of correlates with the warranty on that water heater, but those anodes can be changed out. So that's something you can always reach out to a plumber to, um, to talk about if you, um, if you can beat the warranty. And I, I would have them check it probably a couple of years before the warranty to make sure that you beat it. Um, also, you do want to do visual looks at all of these things frequently um, to make sure that you're not having leaks because uh, they, they can come up quick. Uh, the other thing with the, the water softener and RO especially, they have, as I mentioned, they have that waste product that they basically put down the drain. So you may not necessarily see wet spots around them for their leaks. They may have a valve that malfunctions. Um, not a float valve. They have different types of valve, but their valves can um, default in an open position and basically just run water down the drain. And usually when they do that, um, it's about two gallons a minute. So it's a lot of water and it can be very impactful on your water bill. So definitely, if you're hearing that water running constantly, check that out. Um, because I've seen both um, a water softener and an RO system that's leaking, I've seen them add 100,000 gallons in a one month time on a bill. So definitely things to be cautious of. Also, I wanted to mention SRP, um, the Salt River Project, they are a water wholesaler. They're who we have water allocations from, from the city of Chandler. And so if you have SRP Energy, um, you have access to their marketplace and they offer tons of, um, it's a great place to find water saving products, of course, including the Evolve um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so they discount water and energy saving products. So um, and you can go to that site and all you need to do is Google SRP Marketplace. I actually find that easier than going to the SRP site and trying to find it. Um, also. If you are an SRP customer, SRP um, holds a water conservation every year. It's usually the first Saturday in March, but due to increasing um, COVID numbers, they're going to only have it in a virtual um, component this year. Uh, but you can get smart controllers, which I, I didn't mention yet, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, which will make those adjustments. As I mentioned earlier, if you can adjust your controller for the weather, you're going to conserve more water. 
the smart controllers actually make adjustments um, daily. So, um, and you can get a greatly reduced price on those at the SRP Expo. And you can find that at srpnet.com slash 2022 expo. And it looks like we're getting short on time. So I am going to um, kind of get through these really quick here. We also have our water conservation um, resources and leaks. Um, I'm going to skip the video, but I'll show you where to find that here. We also have our, um, our handbook that not only shows you how to find leaks, but it, um, it shows you how to repair them. Um, and let's see. So this is just a snapshot of what we include. So I'm just going to, I'm going to show you the website really quick. So I'll stop share here. And our website is, um, let me bear with me a second while I get down here. and I'm sharing the site. Hmm. Okay. Do you see the little pig? Awesome. So our website is chandleraz.gov slash water. And this is not the primary page, but this is focused on leaks. And there is a nice video that walks you through how to use your meter to find leaks, especially those hidden leaks or the ones where they're just running down the drain and you don't see any signs of water flowing. Your meter can help you identify that. Um, so, and then we also take you through the steps of checking your toilet. And then we have our finding leaks, um, booklet, which is just, it's a great book. So you can just work your way through all the pages. It will show you how to read your meter. I'm sorry. I'm scrolling back and forth too much. Um, <laughs> it'll show you how to identify where your meter is located out by the street generally, um, and then your line will run up to your house and then you can do some isolation to check if you have a leak inside or outside and it'll walk you through all of that. It will also, um, let's see where they have it. The, it'll show you how to read your meter. Um, but additionally, that video will show you that as well. And then we're not going to run the video. Okay, and then I'm gonna switch back really quick. If we have time at the end, I will go ahead and run that video. But I wanna make sure you get everything. Um, let's see, where are we at? And then we have our, our partnerships and our public awareness. So you'll see a lot of our public awareness comes through Water Use It Wisely. Again, this is a mechanism where many of the cities in the valley and even throughout the state come together to um, develop shared messaging that we can um, put throughout the state. Um, we are also part of the EPA Water Sense Partnership Program. Um, so we certainly promote those Water Sense products and we offer rebates on some of those products. Um, I should say one of those products. Um, and then we also have our hashtag concerns where you can also find us at tons of events, including we would normally be at the SRP Water um, Expo, Water Conservation Expo, but we're also at local events throughout the city like Wolfstock and such. Um, I mentioned the retrofit kits earlier, so we'll skip that. And then I'm actually going to switch this back off, stop share, and we're going to go back to one more website. Okay, can you see, this is um, the entry to our webpage, and you can see we have six primary slots here, but um, most of what we have talked about today is under our resources, and we have it broken out for residents, for our HOAs, for our teachers and students. So for our teachers, we primarily have curriculum and different, um, we offer different programs, educational programs. So we even have a water festival where all the fourth graders, they have in-class education and they come to a big uh, water festival day where they get hands-on learning about our watershed and conservation and our groundwater. So it's very cool. So as I mentioned earlier, we have our how to check for water leaks. You can also find our residential water use calculator here. We have we offer free landscaping and irrigation workshops. So all of that stuff I was telling you about knowing how much your plants need and how to program your controller. Um, if 
we have all the resources here that you can look at. But if you need more information and uh, want to sit through a class, we have classes on everything from gardening to irrigation to design to troubleshooting. Um, we usually have like 22 classes a year. So feel free to attend any of those. Um, and I'll just real quick show you there's registrations for all of our classes are, are open now. Um, you can just go in there and register very easily. We have, um, these are really cool. We have all of our brochures here that you can see. And on that main page, there's actually a form you can order them. We'll mail them out to you if you want hard copies, but they also have digital versions. Um, so this is the digital version of the plant book. The really cool thing about this is you can go in and you can sort by the what you want to look for. If you want to look for trees or shrubs, um, cactus, whatever you're looking for. But additionally, especially with trees and shrubs and even some of the ground covers, they are basically different varieties of the same species. So if you're wanting the tree version of something or the large bush of something, the species name might be slightly different. So if you go in here, it will actually tell you, it'll give you all of the information. I'll also give you more pictures in here that you can see but it will give you how fast they grow, how hardy they are. I don't know about you guys, but I lose my plants to freezes um, more than anything else. So um, I actually wanna know if it can handle those low temperatures because I usually don't get out there in time with my landscape cloth. Um, but this way, you know exactly what the, the end size should be. So let's say you want this small little plant to fit in this perfect spot and you got the wrong species, and now you're constantly having to prune it to make it stay fitting in the wrong space. Or maybe you had this big space and you ended up with this little tiny tree and you don't understand why it won't get to size and it's the wrong species. But here it tells you, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this up here. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Um, I don't know if I can, there, I highlighted it. I'm not going to pronounce it, but it's giving you that species name. So you can take that right to the, um, to, to the, uh, nursery and get specifically the one that you wanted. Um, and you can create a favorites list in here. So it's really cool tool. Um, and then we have, of course, the watering by the numbers guide, and that's a flip book that you can go through. Um, and then we also have our leaks book that I showed you earlier. And then we also have our waterwise landscaping in the Arizona desert. This is specifically for Chandler. And this has an additional about 200 low water use plants in here that are not included in the other one. And again, you can also create a list here. There's also garden pictures so you can kind of see how plants work together. Um, and let's see, I think that's all I'm gonna go through at the moment. We also have our partners that I mentioned earlier and we have all of their links here. Water Use Wisely is a super great one. And I just wanna show you a cool tool here under their outdoor water savings. They of course have the guide cause that was through our joint partnership with them but we have um, the interactive guides here. And they actually have interactive plant watering guides to create your watering schedule for your plants and for your lawn. So it'll actually walk you through the steps to develop what your watering schedule should be. So really cool. And then how are we doing on time? Okay, I think we're back on track. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. We'll go back to our other presentation. And some of the services, sorry, I didn't quite go back to that first screen, but at the um, channelrez.gov slash water, you can find our WaterWise house calls. You can request one there. But basically, if you have a high bill or if you have concerns about using too much water or maybe you need some assistance with your landscape, we are willing to schedule a time to meet you out there and kind of walk you through this um, if our online resources aren't quite enough to get you through that. And we're super happy to help you with that and help get you going. We also will send out high water use notices on your bill. Um, if your water use doubles from the previous month, um, we just, we let you know and, um, and you can feel free to give us a call and we'll come help you figure that out. 
Um, but maybe you already know why it went up. Maybe you refilled your pool. So it's no big deal. Um, we're not trying to, you know, scold you or anything. We're just making you aware of it. So if you need some help from us, we're happy to come out and help you with that. Um, really quickly, we offer, oh, I didn't get there. We offer rebates. Um, and that's on our main page. Again, you can find that on that front page for um, chandlerazy.gov slash water. Um, we have three rebates. We have a new construction or an initial landscape installation rebate. Um, basically for that first time, a landscape installation, that's a flat $200. If you make sure to install at least 50% low water use landscape um, in your outdoor landscape front and backyard need to be completed before you can apply for that. Um, also, we offer a... Um, grass removal rebate. This is not for installing artificial turf. Um, however, that doesn't mean that artificial turf cannot be part of your landscape, but keeping in mind that the requirements on that are that you do install 50% low water use plants in the conversion area. Um, so you want to take that into account with um, when you're converting to artificial turf, because uh, you want to have that cooling factor of the plants. Um, cause, uh, basically artificial turf is considered hardscape. There's nothing breathable or cooling about it. It's not a plant. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, our incentives are also available to non-residential for the, um, turf removal. So if you are a part of an HOA board, um, something you can look at, we also have smart controller rebates which are those weather-based controllers that are going to make those adjustments based on rainfall, um, weather temperatures. And while it doesn't, it seems a little funny to think about a controller changing your um, watering expectations on a daily basis. Think about when we're transitioning from uh, kind of in between fall and winter and summer into fall. Sometimes we can literally go from, you know, 90 degrees and the following week, we're in the very low 70s, even high 60s. So that's a dramatic difference. So making those adjustments um, can actually save you, especially with grass, can save you a decent amount of water. Um, and that rebate, um, I'm sorry, the turf removal rebate, I didn't get to the price. We pay out $200 for every 1,000 square feet of grass that you remove. Um, and then uh, up to $3,000. And then we, um, on the smart controllers, we pay 50% uh, of the cost of the controller up to $250. And this is just a quick example of some of the water savings that an HOA that participated in our program did. And so you can see they con converted 4,500 square feet of grass to low water use landscape for a cost of $2,700 and they installed a smart controller for $800. Um, you can see the rebate amounts that they got paid on the side, the 800 and um, 250. The, their smart controller had an annual um, satellite fee or communication fee cellular of $98. And their first year um, cost savings was 3432, so $3,432. And they saved um, almost one, well, a little over 1.4 million gallons. So you can see what they were, what they actually used after the, the process and what they were using before is in the blue. Um, and the ROI on that, you can see that it basically paid for itself in just about a year. So, um, so lots of water savings potential there. Um, this is a, um, we also have our large landscape water efficiency program, um, which will create a budget for you, which is that blue line, and then we'll help show you where you are at um, and we'll keep you monthly updates and you can actively go in that program and there's a map of your property. And we basically give you the comparisons as far as how much water, um, your difference from budget. So you can see here, if they follow the water budget with or without overseeding, and if we even just go with the with the with overseeding, they would save um, fifteen thousand dollars over fifteen thousand dollars. So those are some things that we have available. So I'll close with that. But I do want final thoughts. 
conservation works. Um, back before our program started, we were using our residentially, we were using 144 gallons per day per person. Um, and currently we are now down to 116 gallons per day. So if we still were having to meet a demand residentially per person of 144, that would require an additional 7.5 million gallons per day to meet that demand. So we do hope you take this all to heart. And remember, there are a number of ways to save and they all start with you. You know, thank you for all of the great information, lots of resources and tools for people to take advantage of. So um, I'm sure that this presentation was very enlightening. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And um, if you, if anybody has any questions um, and they want to reach out to us, our email address is conserve at chandlerez.gov. So we're happy to help you and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. All right. Well, um, if anyone, again, if you didn't get the PDF, let one of us know. We'll go ahead and get that presentation out to you. Um, and hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.